answer from Paul as he speaks to Timothy. So Paul speaks to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And he says to him in a very uh, insightful way that know this, that in the last days, perish. Now the question is, what are the last days? And you can know the last days if you go to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, because the Bible says that in various times, in various ways, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son. So that means from the day of Jesus to the end of time, all those are last days. And Paul says that in the last days of which Timothy you are going to minister, things and the attitude of the people in those days will be as such and he begins to enumerate and in verse 2 he says for men shall be lovers of themselves in other words unlike agape they will be more focused inward than outward and then the bible says not only lovers of themselves but they will be lovers of money now if you have come the scriptures you will know that in chapter 6 verse 10 of 1 Timothy, Paul had already said that the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, if these people are lovers of money, chances are they are going to be inventors of evil in the last days. And it does not end, he says, they are not only lovers of money, but they are boasters, you know. They, they like to walk with what the youth call a swagger. And they, they walk with a sense of loftiness. <laughs> they, they, everyone must feel their presence when they come in. And, and, and the Bible says they are not only boasters, they are proud people. Their attitude is, <laughs> is up in the sky. Because of this pride, they go to the next level and the Bible says they are blasphemers. In, in other words, they take the place of God. If they are in church, if their opinion is not considered, they take offense and they act. Because it is, it is no longer God's word, it's no longer what God says, it must be now them to dictate what goes on. And, and we see this attitude permeating our society. In fact, I once heard one of our ministers saying, even if you report me to God, he can do nothing about it. In other words, the sense of arrogance and the sense of blasphemy has and will increase in the last days. And so Paul, I, I thought he had finished, but he adds, they are not only blasphemers, but they will be disobedient to parents. Now, this is where my trouble is. It seems to me that as we head towards the coming of Jesus Christ, or the last days, as they intensify, parents must be cognizant that there is an attitude of disobedience that is going to loom high. Because the people will be disobedient to parents. They are not only disobedient to parents, they are very unthankful people. Not only unthankful, they are unholy. And then Paul says in verse 3, they are not only unholy, they are unloving. They are not only unloving, they are unforgiving. I once had someone who said, I will never forgive that blood. I will never. And the last time I checked, that person was a Christian, in quotes. Unforgiving people. And then the Bible says they are not only unforgiving, you are still joking, they are slanderers. The, when I was taking the word slanderers, it is close to gossip, eh? character assassination. They, when you do something that seems to be beyond what they have done, they'll make sure they bring you down by at least destroying your name. They are not only slanderers, the last time I checked, they, he says they have no self-control at all. They, as Proverbs puts, puts it, they, wall, they are like a wall without a city. They, you can come in, you pull their here, this side, they will go. You take it that side, they will go. That is the condition of the last days. And, and not only that, I, I, you think I am finished. The, the, Paul is still going on. He says they are not only, and <laughs> they are not only self, um, lack of self-control, they also are brutal. In whatever they do, they are brutal. They can displace people that are advanced in age from their pieces of land where they have been for 50 without any sense of, of care. They, they are brutal. Even their legislation is brutal. And, and then it does not stop there. They are not only brutal. 
they despise what is good. And then he says they are not only that, they are traitors. And if you are politicians, you know what this means then. Today you are with them and they are saying all these sorts of things. You even disclose the intimate and tomorrow they are in the enemy's camp. It's common and it will be common until Jesus comes. The Bible says they will betray you. They are not only traitors, they are high. <laughs> in fact, my Bible uses the word strong headed, you know. In other versions, they say they are high minded. In other words, they think of themselves in a way, in a lofty way, because the next word he says they are haughty. In other words, they are they have a sense of superiority that causes them to look upon others who are inferior to them with the sense of displeasure. And, and Paul is not finished because he says they are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And what shook me is that in verse 5 he says they have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. And Paul says to Timothy, when you see them flee. Now my problem is that Paul is not describing what is in the world alone. He's describing what is in the church as well. And, and my burden is how do you bring up a child in an atmosphere where the attitude is so skewed towards pride, arrogance, disrespect, where it's about insensitivity, love of pleasure. How do you raise a child who you know tomorrow will have to be independent and make decisions of themselves and that child will still stand as a light in this crooked world? In fact, when Paul is writing to the Philippian church, he says to them in chapter 2, verse 14, he says to them, do nothing with complaining or disputing. In other words, when you people of God are doing what you are doing, make sure you do it not in a sense of strife, disputing, complaining, murmuring. Why? Because when you do that, the young generation picks up that spirit and that attitude and tomorrow they are even they have perfected it more than you. And that's why my heart is sudden. Even in our church you sense a, a high sense of conflict, a high sense of disputing, a high sense of complaining and murmuring. And this is creating an environment according to Paul that causes the children not to have that kind of blamelessness that is required for heaven. Because in verse 15 it says that when you do not complain and dispute, then or that you may become blameless and harmless children of God who are faultless in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among which you shine as light to the world. In other words, Paul is saying that the only way to remain shining is that you must have a particular kind of worldview and a particular kind of disposition that will help you to still stand out in this corrupt generation. And if you are with me at this point, you realize that it is not a simple task to raise children. And, 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 and that is why my, my heart is always burdened. I, I have children, but my friend, there is nothing as hard as tearing the, the heart of a child in the right direction. Nothing as hard as that. But I am only comforted by the fact that it is God's interest, and therefore God is willing to partner with me to deliver to the glory of his name. That's what comforts me. But if you look at what is going on in the world, you are certain that these children must find some trouble. One of the children in the Bible that moved me to appreciate the role of their parents are Daniel, Hanania, Mishael, and uh, Azaria. You know, they, they, they moved me because of this. You know, Daniel was 19 years when he went to... In fact, they say he was about 15 because he became prime minister about 19 to 21 years, depending on how you date it. So he was a very young man when he went to Babylon. But you maybe have never taken time to notice. Babylon at that time was the superpower. In fact, one of their arts, and that is the Guzrat or the Hanging Garden, is still one of the seven wonders of the ancient Near East. It was a very... <laughs> You, you would walk into the gate and when they opened Babylon for you, even if you came as a slave, you would delight that you were a slave in Babylon. 
Ay, beautiful. And these young people walked into that. Their parents were not with them. They had to make their own decisions. They had to decide whether they keep their souls or not keep it. It was deliberately on their, but their parents had done their work. And their work was to carefully and clearly and deliberately train them up so that they can make a decision for Jesus Christ. And my Bible, I think it's the same as your Bible. It says that when they came to a point of test, they resolved in their heart that they will not defile themselves. Now, there was no parent to pressure them. But that's what God desires and is looking for. That there will come a time when a child will leave my home and go into this perverse and crooked generation and world and be confronted with decisions to the magnitude of those of Daniel, even to the extent of pleasure, eating at the king's table and having the pomp that the, the world would give. And those kids will stand and look the world in the eyes and say, I belong to Jesus. Come what? Come me. That is the task of a parent and it is not easy and so as I define my problem to that extent I look through the scriptures as well to find about four principles in the time we have that I think are critical if we are to raise these children to model Daniel Meshach and Azaria and the friend and the first one that I considered was that we must be very deliberate in training children. You see, there was a, a, a scientist, uh, a social scientist, I think, who made a research called Diana Bomrit. She made a study about parenting and discovered that parenting is disposed upon two lines. The first one, she called it parental demandingness demandingness, the demand, you know. What parents demand, they must demand for something. And then she said the second pillar upon which parenting gravitates is parental responsiveness. Now, if, for example, you demand of children highly and your response, which relates to the warmth of the relationship between a father and a mother, is also high, then you become authoritative and not authoritarian. But if your demands are high and you are called on love, then you become authoritarian in your parenting. And then there are others who are uninvolved at all. Those ones have low, low demand and at the same time low response and love. They are not concerned, whatever comes, let the children enjoy themselves. Whether they are watching what, they don't care, let them have fun. And there are also others who care a little, but still they don't get into it so deeply. So you have a quadrant where you can have authoritarian rule in a family. You can have authoritative rule where the demand is high, but the love is also extremely high and she suggests that that's where God is because demandedness relates to God's holiness and his truth whereas responsiveness relates to his grace and his love and so God combines truth and grace that's why the Bible says Jesus came to bring forth truth and grace a balance of the two and so having said that I want to believe that we as parents must be deliberate and how do I know this when I read the Bible in the book of Galatians chapter 6, verse 6 and 7, Galatians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, Paul says to the Galatian church that because, you know, he says because we are sons of God, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. In other words, Paul is saying that the moment we said yes to Jesus, God initiated a relationship that is beyond master-servant relationship. God incorporated us as sons. In fact, in the next verse, which is verse 7, he says that we are no longer sons. You are no longer a slave now. You are a son. And if you are a son, you are a heir to God 
through Christ Jesus. Now, that means that from that moment onwards, you become a son. And so as a parent, we have a model that we can look unto in order to know how to discipline children. Because since we are sons of God, God, the way he deals with us is the same way we can learn from how to deal with our children. And in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 6, the Bible makes very profound statements in that scripture. Verse 6, the Bible says that God disciplines the one he loves. I am using English Standard Version because the New King James does not translate it well because the New King James says God, the Lord chastens or chastens those he, he loves. But the, the, the Greek word is not chasten because chasten is in the second phrase where the New King James uses the word scourge, you know. But actually it uses the word, yes, scourge, to beat up, to whip. But the right translation ESV puts it clearly because the word is the Lord disciplines. Disciplining meaning instructs. It does not mean whipping, but it means guiding, which includes most of all those things. And so the Bible says the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he says he chastens those whom he receives as sons. In other words, the day you say yes to Jesus, according to, the, to, to Galatians chapter 6, chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, you become a son. And the moment God receives you as a son, he takes a whip. That is harsh. Don't, don't get disturbed. But the Bible simply says, God begins the process of pruning you and shaping you to ensure that you are a worthy son. In fact, he says, for, you, for the sake of discipline, you must endure the scourging of God. For the sake of discipline. And then Paul adds that not only for the sake of discipline, because God is treating you as sons. For which son, talk to me about which son or what son with whom a father exists that does not discipline that son. That's Paul's argument. Which seems to suggest that the moment you have a son and you're a father and you're a mother, the responsibility in that directly and indirectly is that you must discipline. You must train. In, in fact, it's not negotiable. According to Paul, the presupposition is that once there is a son, then there is discipline. And, and this is why it is good to think about, in fact, he says in the next verse, if the Lord leaves us without discipline, of which all those who went before us were part or participated, then we are illegitimate children and not sons. In other words, you can only live a life where there is no discipline only if you are illegitimate. But the moment you become a son of God, God is a responsible father and he will begin the disciplining process. And, and, and in fact, he says by this, if earthly fathers disciplined us and we respected them, then what about the heavenly father, the father of spirit? Can't we subject ourselves to his discipline and so live? And, and so Paul is arguing in a serious way, and I'm bringing it to ourselves. I'm not looking at God now. Paul is saying the moment you realize you're a father after you have said I do, it is imperative that you also begin to lay a strategy for discipline. When Moses was speaking to the children of Israel in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 4, which is a famous creed for the Israelites, he says to them, Hear, O Israel, for the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Have you heard? Then they said, We have heard. Then he says, Now, since you have heard, I'm glad you have ears. Now, since you have heard, <laughs> You shall love the Lord your God. <laughs> Did you say you had? They said, yeah, we had. Then you shall love the Lord your God, not with some, uh -uh. with all your heart. In fact, you should look in the mirror and see how much the heart is pumping for the Lord. And when you see it pumping, pumping with, with all its might, then you know you are seriously in tune. Because it says you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your 
soul and with all your strength. Those are parents. It is finished. Then he adds, now, <clears throat> and these words that I am declaring to you today, now, now, you shall keep them in your hearts. Now, this is serious because he's talking to parents. And he says, <laughs> when you get to Jordan, across Jordan, and you enter into your promised land, and it's cut out for you, and by the grace of God, you are still alive, then make sure you do about three things. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. But make sure the words you heard me speak to you now, you keep them in. Which means that you must have a daily experience with the word. But it does not stop there. He says, now, after you have fed, you shall teach <laughs> diligently. Remember, my subject was clear, careful, and diligent parenting. And so Moses says, you shall teach them diligently or with energy, with passion, with a sense of delight. In, in, for me, who studies some kind of... Uh, uh, Motivation, they say motivation speaking. They always tell you that until you burn for what you are saying, you cannot convince people. In other words, Moses is simply saying, until you have delight in the word yourself, you cannot teach it diligently because teaching it diligently means that you burn for it. And then he says that you shall talk to them. Eh? You shall teach it in your houses. And then you shall talk to your children when you sit down in your house. Eh? Are you seated? Thank you. Begin talking about these things. And then he says, when you are finished talking to them about the things, you shall not only talk to them when you are seated. When you rise up and you begin to walk on the way, you shall talk to them about these things on the way. Benjamin, yes, the Lord is good. Benjamin replies all the time. Benjamin, yes. The Lord is faithful. He says, hallelujah. Benjamin, he says, yes. Uh, <laughs> the Lord says, thou shalt love your neighbor as you love your... Thank you very much. Benjamin, yes, daddy. And, and, and as you are walking, and then you come home, you are tired. As you are laying it down, you say, Benjamin, the Lord is faithful. You sleep. And then you wake up in the morning and say, hey, Benjamin, where are you? Glory and honor be to the almighty God. He is faithful from the ends of the earth to the ends of the earth. He is faithful. He is holy. And then you begin another day. And if you are walking, you take, which seems to suggest Moses was saying, make the word of God a daily part of the children's experience. Make this word. You know, one of the challenges of our time is that we have segmented time. There is holy time. Divine time hour. In fact, during that time, even the song we sing tend to give us an impression that God has not been around before, maybe far, but now he has come close. We say, keep quiet, keep quiet, the Lord is here. And then, people who have, not, who have been unruly for the first time become serious for a while. And thereafter, they can do whatever they want. But it seems Moses is saying that when the word of God is considered, it should cut across the entire day and become a living part of the children's life. If it becomes so, when they get to Babylon, they are not surprised. They have known over time how to choose. They have known over time what is right and what is not right to choose of. And so for me, I would submit to you that first and foremost, a parent must recognize that disciplining the children must be a deliberate act. As long as he's a father. In fact, during this COVID time, something happened. I was listening to the news. And at the beginning, during the first of the, the Muslim brothers, and then they said on the news that something happened in one family. I was careful to listen. You see, mosques were closed. So leading out in prayers in the family landed on the father. And in one family, something strange happened. As they prepared to do whatever they do during that period, 
the father had been accustomed to taking the children to the mosque and he had never paid attention to the details and the right liturgy that suits their worship. And so when the father began to worship, he looked this way and the little boy said, no, dad, we look this way. Eh! The father in front of the wife. The mother is there and the father is getting embarrassed. Then he began, um, and, and then the boy said, no, father, we say, and, 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 and then the father said, this young boy, what is wrong? And the card said, parents begin, please, to at least go to the mosque quietly and learn the procedure to avoid embarrassment. Because how can your child know where to face and you, the father, don't know? And, and it has happened even in, in our families, you notice that there were people who used to say the pastor is boring. And someone intimated and said, eh, I have a little congregation, but all along I was preaching and people were sleeping. And if you cannot keep that little one alive, now imagine the burden the pastors have to make sure the congregation does not sleep. It is a, <laughs> is a curious thing. But COVID has taught us something, that there are things we had overlooked. That for us, to train these children, we must be daily feeders on the word of God. In fact, Ellen G. White makes a point and a note. She writes wonderfully. I like her writing on this subject. And, and, and she says that when, when Pro, Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in a way that he should go, and when he grows up, he will not depart from it. Now the question is, how do you know the way? If you have not had an experience along that way. And she notes that it is imperative for believers to appreciate that in order to train up people in the way, they must themselves know the way. And that's why Moses said to them, keep these words in your heart, because when you do so, then you have the ability to lead your people and your children in the way. As you, if you have been following me, I have chanced on a scripture in Genesis 18 verse 19. And the scripture says, God is talking about Abraham. And he wants to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, but he wants to reveal that cause to Abraham. So in verse 19 he says, the Bible says, God says, for I have known him that is Abraham. In order that and the word in order that is the reason, a purpose clause. It is purpose, he wants you to know the reason why he has known him. He says, I have known him for this reason, that he may command his children and his household after him. And then he says, to keep the way of the Lord. In other words, unless Abraham knows the way, he cannot lead his children in the way he does not know. So God knows Abraham, the father of the house, to give him the knowledge of the way so that he can lead his people in the right direction to do righteousness and justice so that God may fulfill and bring to purpose and to fulfillment that which he promised to Abraham. And so for me, point number one, which relates to point number two, is that we must be deliberate. But point number two, is that in this generation, it is very difficult to beat people to salvation. You cannot force children to believe in Jesus Christ. In fact, if you succeed, you will only do it as long as they are under your roof. The moment they fly, <laughs> that's the end of it. And that's why when Jesus was relating his image of the sheep and the shepherd, in John chapter 10, Jesus gives some insight on why it is important to have a relationship. Because Jesus says, most assuredly I say to you, that he or the one who does not come through the sheep falls door, but comes through any other way, that person is a thief and a robber. But he that comes through the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And then he says in verse 3 that you see, the doorkeeper will open for him because he can identify him. And then <laughs> when the door is opened for him, 
It is open because the gatekeeper recognizes that he's the shepherd. Now that means he's the father already. DNA proves it. You have no doubt. The child is yours. And then he says that when the shepherd gets into the flock, the Bible says that he will come in and the sheep will hear his voice. Number one. And the Bible says, and he will bring out his own sheep. And then he will call them by name and then lead them out. And then the Bible says, when he has brought them out, he will go before them and they will follow him because they know his voice. He does not even lead from behind. When he brings them out of the fold, he goes before them as Abraham did and he calls them to follow in the way that is moving. Which seems to suggest to me that you can never have your sheep follow you until you have invested in the relationship between you and your sheep. You know how long it takes for the sheep to be trained to pick out that distinctive voice of the shepherd? It takes a lot of investment. It takes a lot of investment in the relationship. And the Bible is clear that the only way you can train your children to live a godly life is first if you develop a relationship with them and they can trust you and they can listen to you. Aaron White says that you can never lead, drive people by force to Christ. You lead them to Christ. As Abraham led his children and others led those they led. So principle number one for me is we must be deliberate. Number two, that deliberateness must be grounded on relationship. If we are in relationship with our children, they will hear our voice. They will listen to our instruction. They will begin to admire what we are saying because they know we have their best interest at heart. And number three is that we must know our children. You know, some of these children we don't know. We sometimes don't even know their fears. We only keep on demanding of them, but we do not know them. But when you read Psalms 139, the Bible says, You have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. Eh? You comprehend all my path and my laying down. You comprehend all my ways. And then he says, but Before the word is upon my tongue. But behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. And you have beset me before and behind. And then the Bible says, you have laid a hand of me. Then David pauses and says, this knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain. In other words, David is saying, how is it that God knows me this deep? Now, when you realize God knows you that deep, then you have the impetus to trust him to guide you and to discipline you because he knows your strength, he knows your weakness. So parents must learn to invest time in knowing their children. That's why in John chapter 10, verse 3, verse 4, the Bible said, he calls them by name. He knows them. He numbers them. You must know your children individually and not collectively if you're going to benefit from them. And then number four, because our time is moving pretty fast. The Bible says you must avoid unrealistic expectations of your children. I think here is where I will pause to put a body. Do you know that many of us parents, we are simply asking children to live as mature people? There's something about children. When they come to church, you want them to sit as a mature person who has understood salvation for 20 years. When they break something, that is, uh, hey, that is trouble. And, and the Bible simply says, do not, in fact, in Colossians 3.21, the Bible says, fathers, do not provoke your children lest they get discouraged. You know, and in Ephesians 6, 4, it says, Fathers, and to you fathers, do not provoke your children, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. In other words, when we put a heavy burden and expectation on the children, they become discouraged because their potential and gifting does not suit what we desire. 
In fact, I have come to a conclusion that some parents, what they fail to do, they want their children to do. You know, I didn't get a four in primary school, but I want my children to get four. Now the problem, that's not a problem. The problem is that in case they don't, we are so, even our emotions will show that we are not pleased. I was a teacher in one school, and when I joined, there was this young man. And this young man was a, a, a good student, brilliant, was doing physics, chemistry, mathematics, and biology. A, a, a student. So the entire school had given him a bursary. And the entire school put the weight upon this young man. When I came, you could feel the young man is carrying the entire school as if he founded it. And they would communicate it. And it deprived him of being a human being. He was always sitting. When he played a little, they say, hey, you are playing, you have to bring 25. And, and the young man worked. Then towards the end of the exam, he got a small challenge with the teachers, and he was discouraged, disturbed. And when he sat his exams, he got a 20. No one praised, no one rejoiced because they wanted a 24. When we went for the Thanksgiving, they didn't even mention his name because they wanted him to get a 25 and he did not get it. How on earth do you put the expectation of your, your failure on a young man? And he went on to campus and got a first class, which means he was not devoid of intelligence. But the point was, he, this was too heavy for the young man. And there are many children who are in bondage in their homes because the parents have put so much of weight on the expectations that they cannot breathe, neither can they be children. And so the Bible invites us that when we are disciplining children and leading children to Christ, we should not put so much unrealistic expectation. We should remember their children. In fact, if you read Psalms 100, verse 13, the Bible says, As the father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows of what frame we are. Because he knows we are of dust. In other words, when God is dealing with us, he's mindful that we are dust. He's mindful that we are not perfect people. And so he treats us with pity. That's why Paul says, nothing has been brought to you that will overwhelm you because God has calculated it in the sense that you can handle it. He has measured you out and he knows that expectation is not so heavy on you. And, and I say again, as I wind up, that another important thing is make sure you make your philosophy of life and principles clearly known to your children. Let them know what you stand for. Let them know in precision what you desire. Let them know so that they are able to navigate along those lines. And if they are able to navigate upon those lines of knowledge, then they are able to live in fulfillment of that which you desire and give glory to Jesus Christ. I will submit to you that we are living in very difficult times. It is a perverse generation. And let me tell you, and I'm honest, and this I'm honest, there are even negative people within church who are negative about the church. And as your children rub around, they hear this negativity. And it corrupts their soul. They begin to get a negativity towards the word of God, the things of God, the programs of the church. They, they, they begin to become negative. And if we are not deliberate, and if we are not careful, and if we are not clear about what God wants us to do, soon they will get out of our nest and become agents of Satan. Ellen White says, harshness drives the soul into the snare of the devil. And so she admonishes that when we are training children, we must be tender, gentle. Remember, he say, she says, that children need not only reproof and correction, but encouragement, commendation, the pleasant sunshine of kind words. I pray that God may help us to be parents that will bring forth a godly seed. It is my prayer that we will take the responsibility of disciplining our children and walk in the counsel of God. In fact, I am reminded as I conclude that Proverbs chapter 23 verse 24 says, The father of a righteous shall rejoice, and he who begets a wise child shall <laughs> delight 
in his soul. In other words, when you bring forth a child and you train the child in the way of the Lord, you will rejoice. In Proverbs 29, verse 15, the Bible says, The rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself will dishonor the mother. And in verse 17, it says, Correct your child, and you shall receive rest. And indeed, yes, you shall receive delight for your soul. It pays to train a child in a way that he should go. But it also pays if you know the way. And you can only do that if you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. My question is, what will your scorecard read when all is said and done? Will that child that is in your family, exposed to the troubles of the world, stand like Daniel and stand out and say, as for me, I have made a choice not to defile myself, but to live for Jesus Christ. God is seeking for a godly seed. And until we do that, we shall not have been successful in raising an army for Jesus Christ. May the living God bless you, friends, even as we consider to live out a life for Jesus. Remember, be deliberate, be relational. And number three, make sure that you know your child. Number four, not only knowing your child, make sure that you have not laid a heavy burden of expectation upon your child. But finally, make sure that your child knows what you stand for and what your philosophy of life is. If they share with you the relationship, they will grow up to mimic your relationship. May God bless you as you live. I don't know many of you, your families, probably there are some strives within. And this month, God was only intending to tell you that nothing is impossible with God. I have hope and confidence that if we allow God to come in and do the work with us, we shall do a good job for the glory of Jesus Christ. So I will invite someone on that side who would like to join me in prayer as we seek God and ask him to assist us in ensuring that we raise an army for the cause of Jesus, to expand the kingdom of God, because we have raised a Daniel, a Mishai, Yel, a an Azariah, and an Ananiah for Jesus Christ in this crooked and perverse way. If it's your pleasure, may we rise up and seek God and ask him to facilitate us, to bless us, that we may find fruition in what we have said I do too. And I'm sure there is someone looking for someone to say I do too. I'm praying God will intervene. I'm sure there is someone who is saying, God, these children of mine are a headache. I'm sure if you invite God, he will assist you. And they will turn out to be angels and lights in this perverse world. Let us pray together. Dear loving Father, this whole month, you gave birth to a conception that we should study your word and navigate the waters of family life. And we know for a fact that when the devil targets the family, he destroys the civilization. Not only that, Lord, he destroys an opportunity to rear forth a godly seed. And that is why you pay attention to our families. That is why you always speak to us, that we may be able, loving Father, to fulfill your purpose. Now, as a minister of the gospel, eternal Father, having done your word, I know your word is true. You are not a man that you should change your mind. Nay, the son of man, Lord, that you should turn back on your word. You have spoken and you will do. You have said to yourself and to us that nothing is too hard for you. Now allow me to bring to you that young person who is looking for someone with whom, Lord, they will raise a godly seed. Before they say, I do how I pray that you guide the steps, that you may cause them, Lord, to find each other in the way Ruth and Boaz found themselves. I also pray for those who have just said, I do, and probably they have begun to see things that they never expected. It is true that there will be challenges, but I'm praying that, Lord, you stay close to them to show them that with you they can do all things, that with you they can thrive, that with you they can succeed. I want to pray for those eternal Father that are having some sense of conflict, where, Lord, you anticipate that they can go forth to enjoy life in abundance. My prayer is that you intervene, 
My prayer is, eternal Father, that you bless them, that, Lord, you create an environment so that the children thereof may grow to admire you, may grow to love Jesus, may grow to serve Jesus. I pray for the children in a special way, Lord. May they be given a tender heart that will listen to the counsel of their parents, knowing that it is in their best interest that the parents discipline them. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for this month. Now, Lord, as we get back now to the reading of your word for other insight, may we be blessed in the coming month again with other insights that can help us to live a godly life for Jesus' sake. May you touch each one of us according to our points of need, and may you blossom us, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you and keep you until we meet again. We shall be back in the afternoon. So, may we say the grace as we part shortly. May the grace of our Lord, Jesus Christ, the ship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.
Thank to God, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are very grateful that finally our roof construction materials have arrived. In my background are part of the materials that will be used for our roof. There are even some trucks more that are coming in and uh, we offloaded the roof tiles. I believe we shall see some photos of them. They are already here with us. We thank the Lord thus far we have come. It has been a long journey, but God has enabled us reaching this side. Uh, I believe that through God's will, within the next four to six weeks, we shall be having a roof on our church. And surely, I believe God is still merciful to us that despite the COVID-19 pandemic and the effects it has had on us, by God's will, we can be able to enter our sanctuary in 2020. Uh, we thank you so much for the contributions you've been giving us, for the support you've been giving construction as a department, development as a department. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are even calling upon you that in the same spirit as God has blessed you, continue supporting us, continue supporting us, and that to ensure that uh, by God's will we can enter our sanctuary. We pray that uh, wherever you are in your homes, continue praying for this project so that it moves from one level to another. Let us continue supporting development through the e-giving uh, platform. One by one, we shall be there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wish you a blessed time. Thank you.